Well, I think um, I refer back to the open source aphorism. You know, the most important thing you can do in open source software development is scratch your own itch. It is a general rubric that is a good guide for utility. And so mostly I built maps to solve my own problem in terms of understanding the development of internet infrastructure. It started with undersea cables around the African continent, but has spread to other issues. And uh, I've never really thought of myself as a visual thinker, but apparently I am because I really appreciate being able to put things in a picture together. You're listening to Ping, a podcast by APNIC discussing all things related to measuring the internet. I'm your host, George Michelson. This time, I'm talking to Steve Song, who lives in Nova Scotia, a province on the east coast of Canada. Steve is an expert in telecommunications policy, information and communications technology in developing countries. His work is supported by the Mozilla Foundation and he works with NSRC, the Network Startup Resource Centre, and with APC, the Association for Progressive Communications. All three organisations will be well known to you for their work in internet development and capacity building and for their participation in the public policy debates. Steve is also the founder of Village Telco a social enterprise that manufactures low-cost, Wi-Fi mesh and VOIP technologies. I discussed with Steve some work he's doing, mapping the network and in particular CDNs worldwide. So Steve, welcome. Hi, I'm Steve Song and in my professional life, I'm a policy advisor, half time under contract to the Mozilla Corporation, where I work on transparency issues and general access to internet issues. Mozilla is a company that believes that the internet should include everyone and I'm part of that mission. Although I should quickly add the caveat that nothing I say today represents Mozilla formally in any way. And the other part of my time, I work for um, a global NGO called the Association for Progressive Communications, or APC, that is a um, network of civil society organizations around the world that work on uh, digital rights issues, and in particular, work on supporting community-owned internet infrastructure. And so I work on the policy and regulatory aspects of that. I also informally work with the Network Startup Resource Center, which helps people build networks. With three hats on at a time, you're actually covering quite a lot of ground there in the engagement space with the wider world, the parts of the internet that are often less easy for people to reach. And that kind of fits for me with what I hope we're going to talk about today, which is some activity you do around mapping, geolocating, putting things in their proper location. Could you just talk a little bit about why maps in the context of the internet interest you so much? Well, I think um, I refer back to the open source aphorism, you know, the most important thing you can do in open source software development is scratch your own itch. It is a general rubric that is a good guide for utility. And so mostly I built maps to solve my own problem in terms of understanding the development of internet infrastructure it started with undersea cables around the African continent, but has spread to other issues. And uh, I've never really thought of myself as a visual thinker, but apparently I am because I really appreciate being able to put things in a picture together. If we just talk a little bit about CDNs, content distribution networks, I think for old timers like you and me, we've got similar amounts of <laughs> gray hair showing <laughs> on the top. The internet was classically fully end-to-end, me talking to you was an unimpeded conversation of packets flowing between us long haul. And in fact, for Australia, somewhere around 75% of all traffic was essentially long haul traffic. There was no content locally. But a CDN is about a subtle shift in how information in a global internet is delivered in a way, isn't it? CDNs are about ending some of that long-distance tyranny and bringing content closer 
to where people really are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly caching internet content is nothing new. And the old squid cache goes back to the early days of the internet. But CDNs are really kind of caching on steroids where there are racks of servers that are taking and updating and refreshing content dynamically so that it appears instantaneously in our browsers or in our streaming devices. I think part of the motivation for this map was recognizing that that very few people actually know much about how the internet arrives on their device and that these are CDNs or kind of hidden infrastructure of the internet that uh, that came to light really in the context of the EU fair share debate, you know, which I know you've discussed with Jeff Houston quite a lot, in that who is investing in infrastructure? And I think one of the claims of the European telcos is that is that they were shouldering the burden and that the big platforms were not paying their quote unquote fair share. So part of it was really to to surface the extent to which our infrastructure is actually provided by CDNs. And honestly, it was a revelation for me, just to, you know, the extent of CDN infrastructure, uh, for which I think I've only really scratched the surface. Classic internet, it's all about packets. You send a packet, you receive a packet, you have trains of packets flowing down lines, you lose a packet in the middle, Sometimes that means you have to go back slightly earlier in a window of packets to get something resent. Sometimes you just throw it away, and it means you suffer a loss of data in transit. The longer that piece of wire, you kind of get three things out of it. You get delay, you get jitter, differences in arrival of packets, and you get loss. Packets have to be dropped because devices along the path are dropping them. So you bring a CDN to the table, it kind of changes things a little bit, doesn't it? You still have packet sent, packet received, but the distance they're traveling can be radically reduced. And that means the consistency of service delivery, the jitter component, and the packet loss drop can kind of go away. So this is really quite directly a quality issue in some ways. Internet will work if you're prepared to put up with the loss. CDNs bring back the quality. So can you explain why that becomes an equity of access issue? Sure. I think there's one thing I would add to that, and that is it's a cost-saving issue. I mean, if you're not in uh, North America and Europe, you're typically paying to build your bridge to a peering point in London or Amsterdam or New York. And the cost of international transit is a significant factor in being an ISP in South Africa or in Kenya. So being able to cache content locally is a huge deal in terms of the overall cost of your infrastructure. But also it can play a significant role in leveling the playing field for our operators as well. I think the first CDNs we saw typically located at IXPs where everybody was able to benefit from faster access to content and it generally lifted the market in general. Now I think we're seeing these uh, CDNs being deployed further and further into the network and often behind corporate ISB or corporate operator firewalls and uh, closer to the customer, which is a good thing in one way, but also perhaps for the smaller ISBs, slightly problematic in terms of them having access to the same kind of CDN resources as the, the big operators. So it brings with it this question whether the competitive tensions between local providers are actually in an equalized playing field, because once the large players bring capacity and assets to the table, you get a qualitative rise from service delivery. But it's a bit like the cash flow is maybe being exported back offshore. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the um, in the debate between the platforms and the uh, the European telcos, I mean, I don't think there's anybody wearing the white hats in this context. I mean, the, uh, I'm reminded of the, uh, the Kenyan proverb, when elephants fight, it is the grass that suffers. And this is very much a fight between two types of industry or two industries that are both quite successful and quite profitable. I think the, the challenge we have here in thinking about the fair share debate is thinking about how do we get back to an internet that actually 
isn't driven by just a few companies, an internet that supports a multiplicity of service providers and operators. And so I think the downside of purpose-built CDNs like Netflix's um, cash or like a Google cash or a Facebook cash is that they really, they do entrench those particular service providers as opposed to say more generic caches like Cloudflare or Akamai that are open to all comers to provide caching services. Thinking about the idea of mapping, putting things in their proper location, there's two qualities at play. There's the map, which is the connectivity map. It's a more abstract map of who connects and the paths between things. And there's the physical map, the map in place. What is the distance barrier, the component of actual distance that's affecting things like round trip time and delay? Are you mapping both? I have aspirations to map both. And I think uh, other organizations like the Internet Society are interested in this space. And of course, there are also research institutions like CADA that are engaged in this kind of research. But what we have at the moment is kind of gaps between the two. So I'm very interested in mapping the physical infrastructure of the Internet because actually knowing where the cables are has all kinds of implications in terms of access, in terms of understanding ownership in terms of understanding influence. And the CDNs are a part of that. They're a part of that physical, a part of the, the internet. But then there is already a lot of mapping going on in terms of internet routes. And you've got platforms like Route Views, where, where you can map the packets across from ASN to ASN across the internet. And I think there's an opportunity to sort of try and bring the two layers together, but we're not quite there yet. But I think it's fundamental we pay a lot of attention to the ones and zeros, but we don't pay a lot of attention to the fiber optics and the, um, the rack servers that are the, the layer one of the internet. And uh, I think of it like kind of ignoring the ocean currents or the continental gyre or the trade winds. If you were a you know, 17th century mariner, if you didn't pay attention to that, then you, know, you would wind up somewhere where you didn't expect. And I think the physical connections of the internet also shape traffic. They shape the growth of traffic. And certainly, you know, an area of particular interest for me is the African continent. And where there are CDNs, your performance is orders of magnitude better yeah. than in an area where you're doing all of these round trips, as we were just discussing. So in TCP terms, people often use round trip time and triangulation, three, two or three points of connectivity forwarding and looking at round trip times. It's analogous to the sailor metaphor you're using, the idea of the cocked hat, the triangle of placement that you do from three measurements, three fixed points. So there's a very strong quality that TCP itself will actually tell you. I know that this thing is 200 milliseconds from Nairobi and 500 milliseconds from <laughs> Johannesburg and 2,000 milliseconds from Turkey. So I know it must lie within a radial distance of all of these objects. It's really strong. But there's another quality to mapping, which is kind of people scratching their heads going, yeah, but if you picked up the phone and asked Akamai to tell you which DC they have located their rack in, you can physically place the infrastructure. And to me, these two things actually join in a sense. There's the logistical question, who has the control? Where have they placed? And there's the internet question, what's its impact on delay? So again, are you kind of looking at both? Yes. I mean, as I say, have, I have aspirations in that direction. I think the challenge I find is in transparency of organizations and their willingness to share. So they just don't want to say where they've located this infrastructure for trade, strategic or security reasons. They'd rather not talk about. It. Well, you know, there's an irony here in that some organizations are more transparent than others. And I found this in particular with mapping fiber optic infrastructure across the African continent. Some operators would provide detailed maps down to curbside of their fiber infrastructure, and some would not provide the time of day to even discuss the issue. And so it's a normative issue. And having spent about 10 or 12 years crowdsourcing data about African fiber networks, I've 
come pretty strongly to the conclusion that crowdsourcing is not really going to work. I mean, the CDN map, I sort of scraped it. I wrote a a few scrapers from the um, the corporate websites, in some cases depended on some clever research by people like Anurag Bhatia, who was able to reverse engineer the location of the Facebook caches by finding the airport codes embedded in the fully qualified domain names. So this is the thing that diagnostically people who are running networks actually have to have some way they can quickly derive which piece of their own equipment is broken. And it seems to have been an emerging behavior. Everyone in the industry uses the three-letter airport codes as the closest boundary point to mark where the equipment is along the path. So it's kind of a semantic analysis, isn't it? You look at the IP addresses, you translate them to the names, and you then string search for clues of letters that tell you it's the airport code for Johannesburg, and you've located the equipment. Yeah, and I was surprised to discover that Netflix employed the exactly the same mechanism for their caches. Uh, yeah. But I think what's good for the goose is good for the gander in terms of, I mean, it's useful internally, but there's a huge amount of value that can be derived externally in terms of if you're a national strategic planner, you want to improve the quality of the internet in your country. Well, understanding yeah. where CDNs are and aren't, just like IXBs, is fundamental to that planning. So you kind of touched on the idea of normative behavior here, which is the nice version of regulated behavior, but the two of them are coming to the same space. It is as community, as users, as engaged participants, and as government, strategic planners, and as corporate and smaller SME entities, we actually need to know this information. And so it could be normative that the industry decides to talk about it, or it could be regulatory, that it becomes something the industry is required to tell us. There's a bit of a tension between the two, but the part underneath I think I like is we kind of know we need, we need to know. The approach that we've taken with fiber infrastructure is somewhere in between there. Uh, Together with the World Bank and the ITU and the Internet Society and some African telecom operators, we proposed an open standard in the spirit of RFCs, right? You know, we've proposed a standard for describing fiber optic infrastructure, and we're working with operators to say, look, this is good for you. If you share data in this format, then A, you'll know that you're not sharing any more than your neighbor because, I mean, there's a lot of mistrust among operators. B, you'll know that when you read your neighbor's or your competitor's data that you'll be comparing apples with apples in terms of the infrastructure. And C, you'll actually be able to build a coherent picture of the infrastructure because this is one of the revelations. I'm digressing a little from CDNs to, to fiber. One of the revelations of developing this standard was realizing that Nobody has the full picture in their country, typically, because the regulators insist the operators provide maps. But those yeah. maps, if an operator in Australia says, well, I've got fiber from Sydney to Melbourne, and every other operator reports the same information, which yeah. one of them owns that fiber? Which one of them has an IRU or dark fiber? Which one has just has lit capacity? Yeah, that actually is quite an interesting component of this, because if we consider the ISO seven layer model, most of what people talk about in the internet kind of lucks out at layer two, the link layer, their belief that they are plugging a device into a thing, physical layer. Yeah, you kind of walk away a bit from that. And in fiber, as you've just (laughs) said, there's this tendency for people to say, I have fiber, when what they actually mean is, I've secured lease rights over somebody else's capital asset. And the problem for lots of people would be that the strategic question in fiber is how many physical different pieces of wire, how far apart, are there connecting me? Because if you consider some places like the Luzon Strait, It's incredibly crowded with fiber, and it's an earthquake zone. So if you have taken lease on a fiber, and it just happens to be going through the same path as your primary fiber, you have no backup against the physical event, none. Absolutely. So this transparency issue has everything to do with internet resiliency. I was speaking to a fiber operator in Accra, Ghana, 
And they described a scenario where they were negotiating for a backup link with a competitor to be able to uh, buy a redundant link to increase the resiliency and uh, of their network. And it was only at the 11th hour of negotiations on price that they worked out that their competitor was trying to sell them dark fiber on the same cable, which they already had capacity. And yeah. the tip of the iceberg in terms of the uncertainties around physical infrastructure it was just shocking to me, speaking to operators who didn't have a fully complete map of their own network because of the turnover, right? People are building networks and somebody's given the job of documenting it and it hasn't been done to a standard because there is no standard for describing fiber infrastructure. And then the next person comes in and you get a kind of slow uh, degradation of the quality of the information, which you know is updated in some cases, but not in others. So it really was quite surprising to me. You also have mentioned you've been looking at the, the wireless spectrum use, radio spectrum use across Africa as well. Now, that's a different kind of map. That's more the map of frequency. Is that about consistency and availability of technology to supply that service? Or is it about the contention and the risks for people actually colliding in radio space? What's going on there? Well, when it comes to wireless spectrum, of course, everyone's familiar with Wi-Fi, and lots of ISPs use Wi-Fi to deliver services, but there are distinct limitations with that technology, particularly in power output. And so, obviously, other frequencies, such as those that are used by mobile network operators, are now coming into play for smaller operators. We're increasingly beginning to see regulation for private network operators, private 5G, private 4G networks, and regulations being introduced by regulators that, that allow, instead of just a blanket national license, individual licenses for operators so that you could do not just Wi-Fi, but fixed wireless access services or small cell in a particular city. You could provide uh, local LTE or 5G services. All of that is on the table now. But if you're an ISP or if you're a community-owned infrastructure operator, in order to have that conversation with the regulator, You've got to be able to know what spectrum is available and what's not available. And because yeah. many regulators are a bit deficient in terms of publishing that information, there's another opportunity for kind of like standardizing, making that information available. It's an asymmetric conversation. The people who are actually going to make capital commitments to deliver a service in a location may not have access to information that would materially alter how they bid and what service they offer. You need to bring that to the table so people can look at it and say, what choices do I make here? I am true for fiber as well. So where I live here in Nova Scotia, we formed a cooperative in my little town and we got a secondary network operator license from the regulator and we designed a small fiber network to, to serve a small community and then began to negotiate with the big operators here, the incumbents, for access to fiber. And um, we asked for maps, but... Uh, even being a licensed operator, they refuse to provide them. They play kind of a game of go fish. Do you have fiber in Burnaby? No, go fish. And it's, it's ridiculous. You know, we should know where that infrastructure is because ISPs, community networks, I mean, they should all be able to go to those points of presence because those are the deep water ports of the internet, right? You know, once you get onto fiber, your capacity is effectively unlimited. Coming back to Africa, it's a large continental mass. There are logistics issues with doing a classic spine with bones coming out. It's most likely that this kind of development of infrastructure is looking at rings running around the edge with fingers coming in. Is the continent as a whole now cohesively served, or do we actually have emerging gaps in service delivery because of different approaches to how we're doing this? Oh, yeah, I don't know how you would measure adequately served. I would say the explosion of investment in terrestrial fiber infrastructure on the continent over the last sort of 10 to 15 years has been extraordinary. There's well over a million kilometers of fiber across the continent. 
in countries like uh, South Africa, Kenya, Egypt, Ghana, Nigeria, there is a huge amount of fiber. And also in the smaller countries, those are kind of the leaders. You know, the, um, there isn't, I think, as much of a cohesive national strategy in most countries in terms of how does that fiber all fit together. And there needs to be more cross-border initiatives, which are growing now and have been growing over the last few years. But cross-border interconnection is only going to increase resiliency and bring down prices. But it's been slow to come because crossing borders is political as opposed to purely infrastructural, right? Yeah. And so those things have come through kind of successive bilateral agreements. But, uh, you know, I think there's an opportunity through kind of trade agreements to accelerate that cross-border development to fiber, which I think will be very helpful. These are long-term investments. You get quite a long life out of a decision to deploy a large fiber like this, don't you? It's easily a 15-year, 20-year lifetime for this kind of capital play. But telephone equipment, radio equipment, mobile telephony, it's often seen as a two or three year window to achieve your financial outcome. So there's kind of a bit of a gap emerging there in my mind. Some of these things you make the play for the long period. Others, you actually have to achieve financial viability very quickly. Well, and I think that has actually been a problem in that fiber networks have been treated like other kinds of telecom infrastructure in that um, operators are actually often going for a very rapid return on those fiber networks and ultimately limiting uptake on those networks by maintaining high prices. And this is true across um, certainly many countries in the African region, but I think globally as well, is that unless you're a state-owned operator with a very kind of forward-looking government that says, we're actually going to focus on the network externalities that are going to be derived from this network, not from trying to make a profit on the, the infrastructure itself, you actually end up cutting off your nose to spite your face. And I think we've seen that in a lot of countries where internet, the actual utilization of fiber infrastructure is low because it's still expensive. And I think also, I think one of the challenges is that this is that infrastructure is also often priced by distance. So the further you are away from the landing point, landing station, or by, from the capital city, the higher your cost of access to the fiber backbone are, which means that if you're an ISP trying to deliver services in a rural area, you're already carrying an anvil around your neck with the cost of backhaul just to get to, uh, to the landing point. Yeah. But that also brings the CDN participants into sharp focus because there's now this question, which side of a long-haul component of fiber does a CDN choose mm -hmm. to be? And there's a second question kind of lying underneath. What if the CDNs are now players in owning and building fiber networks? Do you look at any of that space? Well, I think this is another issue that just another reason for more transparency in this space, because the ownership of fiber infrastructure is key. I think of it as a kind of feudal system. If you own fiber infrastructure, you can actually make deals with other fiber operators, right? For instance, Hurricane Electric opened up a point of presence in Nairobi and was offering the best deals in the country in terms of access to their point of presence. They had no infrastructure in Kenya. They didn't even have a, an operator license, as far as I know. Yet they were able to trade their international capacity for domestic capacity and offer a service. I think of it like European royalty marrying off their children into other fiefdom. This sort of trading of capacity on networks is very, very powerful. Whereas if you don't own fiber infrastructure, you are a serf in many ways. You know, in Northern England, there's this wonderful community-owned fiber network called Broadband for the Rural North, or BARN. And yeah. it was set up in Lancashire in a place that BT determined was unviable for high-speed infrastructure. But the very first step they did when they raised money was not to build a local network, but yeah. was to own their own dark fiber all the way to the IXP in Manchester. Because without owning that, their own dark fiber, they would be at the mercy of BT or other service providers and would not be able to actually make their business model work.
There are very similar stories about the west coast of Scotland that is in logistical sense driving perhaps only one hour away from major metro centres, but in logistical fibre planning sense is far too small a market for someone like BT to deploy service. So there's a universal service obligation that grants are made available for small communities to do exactly what you've talked about doing in Nova Scotia or in Lancashire and build out your own infrastructure. And there's a rather funny play that happens, you get one of these grants and the minute you have this, the letter from the authority saying you have received funding to deploy a local community network, a salesperson from BT rings up and says, hi, we'd like to deliver fiber to you. So there's this aspect that the act of saying we are going to go ahead and build our own invites the majors to say, maybe we'll put money in the ground for you instead. It's a funny yeah, business. Yeah, I mean, even that worst case scenario is actually a win for the community. Right, I mean, get the fiber either yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Stephen, this kind of activity obviously incurs real costs. Have you had any assistance or engagement from the various people that you're working with on this as well? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, in the early stages of mapping uh, infrastructure, I couldn't have done it without the help of the Network Startup Resource Center, or NSRC, as I'm sure is familiar to many people at APNIC. I'm sure people here will recognize NSRC. They've been doing a huge amount of work in our region, doing training, capacity building, and development work. It's a really great organization. You mentioned you also work with the APC, the Association for Progressive Communications. Yes. So in their work on supporting community network development around the world, from a policy and regulatory point of view, they really embraced this issue of transparency and the need for open data standards within the policy and regulatory regulatory realm. And I think perhaps most of all at the moment, I would say I'm really grateful to Mozilla, who through the Mozilla Manifesto, which is about a, a truly inclusive internet, have really embraced this idea as well and have made time available for me to be able to, to pursue this. You've got some resources that point to your various efforts at cataloging and collating information about this. I mean, there are links that I can put up on the blog post that we'll do in conjunction with this podcast. But are there any in particular you'd like to draw attention to if people are interested in having a look on Line. Certainly, I would love to generate more interest in this CDN map. I think there are people a lot smarter than I am who could help expand the range and quality of that resource. And there's a link to the, the GitHub repository there. And I would welcome people to get in touch. I think the Open Fiber Data Standard repository, which is also a GitHub site and a documentation site, this is the tip of the iceberg in terms of my ambitions, right? documenting fiber, I would like to see a whole range of open data standards for telecommunications infrastructure writ large so that we can add, properly add layer one into the mapping of global internet infrastructure. We'll make sure that um, links to those resources are made available to people because I think that aspect of community-fed, publicly available catalogs, information about these things, I think it's the bedrock of actually building the kind of network we want to have. Stephen, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you about this. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, I really appreciate it and I really enjoyed talking to you as well. So thank you. Oh, that's really good. Thank you. If you're interested in looking at Steve's work, the blog article accompanying this podcast on blog.apnic.net has links to his awesome connectivity info pages. If you've got a story or research to share here on Ping, why not get in contact by email to ping at apnic.net or via the APNIC social media channels. Also, Remember, the measurement at apnic.net mailing list on Orbit is there to discuss and share relevant collaborative opportunities, grants and funding opportunities, jobs and graduate placings, or to seek feedback from the community on your own measurement projects. Be sure to check out the APNIC website for all your resource and community needs. Until next time, 